Soul Trails and Ghost Town. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts, and with me is Bill Barley. He is an author, former school teacher, gold miner himself, and great storyteller. And today we're heading to a part of the country which uh, you could spend, I guess, a lifetime on, the caribou. Where in the caribou? Well, a lot of people have spent a lifetime just mining in this area, Mike. So we're looking at, I think, the most famous placer gold region in the province. And this is the heart of the caribou. When you're talking about the caribou, you're talking about the 1860s when the original discoveries were made. Talk about famous towns like Barkerville. And you talk about some of those renowned creeks of the past. Williams Creek, is, of course, is the most famous. You had Nelson Creek, and you had Antler Creek, and Cunningham Creek, Slough Creek, Last Chance Creek, a lot of creeks, but the second most famous creek in that, in that particular district is Lightning Creek. And that's the creek we're going to talk about today. And the reason is, is because it's a fascinating story. The initial miners on Lightning Creek made a fortune. But the, the miners who went in later on, some of them made a fortune, and some of them lost a fortune. This is a creek that has the reputation of breaking more hearts and more purses than any creek, any placer gold creek in the province of British Columbia. Lightning Creek in the Caribou, and we'll yep. do that when we come back from this break. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley talking about Lightning Creek today. What era are we talking here? Well, we're talking early 1860s, Mike. And the initial creeks in the Caribou really were discovered in the fall of 1860. And then the, they come into quick, in quick succession. You have Antler Creek, you have Cunningham Creek, you have Williams Creek, and a number of other smaller creeks. And all these are staked from, from stem to gudgeon, really. And one of the guys was the original discoverer of Cunningham Creek. It's named after him. His name is Billy Cunningham. He gets onto Jack of Clubs Creek, and Jack of Clubs Creek is hard to read. So he goes west with two other prospectors, a guy named Jim Bell and a guy called Jack Hume. And they're all American prospectors. And they start coming down this, this wide flowing creek and a deep creek, very tough creek to ford. And as they go west, he has a peculiarity, kind of an oddity. And Cunningham, when anything gets tough, he refers to it as lightning. So if they have to make a tough crossing of the creek, this is a lightning crossing. And he reversed everything. Finally, they get to a place in this creek where it's almost impassable, it, it, it's virtually impassable. So he looks at it and he says, well, this is really lightning. And the other two guys said, well, we, we may as well call it Lightning Creek. <laughs> yeah, we, you've pretty well described it to now, and so th they're hence the name. So this is how the creek gets no its name. No flashes or anything from the sky, just darn tough from beginning That's to end. That's all. No lightning storm, nothing like that. And what they do is they discover that this is a Bonanza Creek. And they start getting gold, and the gold they get, Mike, I'll show you some of the gold if you'll just this? take that pan. Alrighty. And this is some of the type of gold they get, and almost exactly the same. <laughs> you like the sound. And, you know, I that is that is coarse gold, it's nugget gold, it's what they call old gold, it's oxidized gold. And they stake, and Cunningham stakes a great claim, and Bell stakes a great claim, and Hume stakes a great claim, and some other individuals who follow them stake some magnificent claims. One of these guys is a guy called Ned Campbell. And Ned Campbell has a little show on Lightning Creek, and here's how good it is. In the first day, Mike, he takes out 900 troy ounces. He rounds it off to the 100. That's 75 troy pounds of nugget gold. The second day is a little, little poor. He takes out 500 ounces. Of, and that's a little over 40 p troy pounds of gold. The third day, he goes down to 300 ounces. And that's a little over about 25 pounds of troy gold. This is three successive days. In three successive days, he takes out 1,700 ounces of nugget gold, which is about 142 troy pounds of gold. He can barely stagger back to his cabin with all this gold. Ned Campbell. Ned Campbell. Good man to tap for a loan at this time? I mean, what well, happens with Ned? This is a spectacular run, and Ned Campbell, like many of the other prospectors, goes back home with his, with his poke, or his stake, as we would say. But they stake all the creeks in that area. Lightning Creek is a great creek. And the interesting thing is, most of the tributaries coming from the south carry coarse gold. Those coming from the north don't carry much gold. So they stake Grub Gulch and Perkins Gulch and Last Chance Creek and Amador, Canadian Creek, uh, uh, lots of creeks in the area are staked all the way down. 
And so literally there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miners in that area, Mike. And the ones who are on shallow bedrock, that, the gold always drifts to bedrock. And those who are on shallow bedrock do as well as Ned Campbell did. And they do exceptionally well indeed. And many fortunes are made on Lightning Creek. What are we talking? Uh, tens of fortunes? Dozens of fortunes? Oh, we're, hundreds of fortunes? We're talking probably close to 100 fortunes in the 1860s rush. And they were just sort of grabbing it off the top. That's right. But what happens in this creek, and it's kind of an, it's a fascinating creek, Mike, because it has some problems that no other creeks in the Caribou have, with the exception of Slough Creek, perhaps. And what they have is they have the Caribou Slum, which is kind of a watery clay mix that comes into the diggings. And once you hit that, you're in deep, deep trouble. And also the bedrock in parts of that creek goes to 165 or 180 feet. So after that initial rush of the 1860s, the miners start to drift away, looking for easier diggings, what they'd call poor man's diggings. And this is what they do until the late 1860s and the early 1870s. Now, did any town or of any sub substance spring up here, or did well, these prospectors just sort of camp out? Well, there is a town in, in the 1860s. This is old Van Winkle. And, you know, you read the, some of the reports about Van Winkle. It's supposed to be 1,000 people in Van Winkle. Nonsense. There are only about 10 or 12 buildings in Van Winkle, and there were probably 100 people in Van Winkle. Now, that didn't, didn't mean that there weren't individuals all around that area on the various creeks in Grub Gulch and Perkins Gulch and all the rest, Butcher Bench. Butcher Bench, for instance, the big, one of the biggest nuggets were corded off the creek, uh, over 30 ounces, almost three troy pounds, like a small potato. Good heavens. So this is, this, is, <laughs> this is what we call lead gold, Mike. Yeah. And then after, so we have that 1860s rush, the, the shallow diggings are cleaned up. And then the bulk of the miners move away. But at the end of the 1860s and the early 1870s, some of the miners realize that there must be good gold on the deep ground. So they come back in and they start staking huge claims, huge claims. And the three most famous claims are the three Vs, the Victoria, the Vancouver, and the Vulcan. And those three claims are really between the old town of Van Winkle and the new town of Stanley. So that's Down Creek, about a mile and a half away. That's all from, ba from Van Winkle. And these three claims use Cornish wheels. And the reason they use Cornish wheels, that's to raise the water from the depths. And these Cornish wheels, some of these, Mike, were so efficient, each Cornish wheel would throw a million gallons a day. It also shows you just how ugly the situation was down these. Because we're not talking hard rock mining; we're talking of ding sinking a shaft into gravel. That's right. And it may be pretty consolidated. I mean, you may be able to do it, but it's just right. muck. And they had to put in a drainage system as well, which is still there to this day, by the way. So they they sunk those shafts down to bedrock, put in a drainage system, used the Cornish wheels. One of those Cornish wheels breaks down, they're in trouble. They'd have to pull out of the shaft and pull all the miners out as well. So those Cornish wheels were going 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And the original, the original owners of those three big leases, the Vancouver, the Victoria, and the Vulcan, made independent fortunes. Now, some of them didn't do as well. With the poor 11 of England, 11 miners come over from England, they're good miners, they're Cornish miners, they go down creek from Stanley, and they try to tap the deep ground down there. This is over 100 feet. They spend a fortune, they spend most of their life working in that. They never do do it. So uh, when, when you say, now, what happens when you get down deep? Uh, as you are digging down through the gravel, what do you see when you get down to bedrock? What's down there? Well, Mike, really what is down there is exactly what they found in the, in, in the third rush. In the third rush, so you have the rush of 1860s, you have the rush of the 1870s, and now you have another rush in the 1890s. And they get down to some of this deep ground, and they get some, down to some of this deep ground in a place called Wing Dam, which is way down the creek. Now, you, that's between actually the Cottonwood and, and Stanley itself. And Wing Dam was ground 160, 165 feet deep in that area. And they get down there, and the guy who really started Wing Dam was a guy called Charles Unversacht, one of the most disreputable mining promoters in the Caribou. And there are a number. And uh, he, was, he was astonishing. And, but he knows that the gold is deep. And he goes down there using other people's money, of course. And when they get down there, and when we're talking about Wing Dam, Mike, we're talking about an area that has been worked on and off since the 1890s. So that's practically 100 years. And they get down there at the 160-foot level, and Wing Dam was worked 1890s, 1910, 20, 30s, 40s, right up to the 1950s. In fact, I talked to people who worked in Wing Dam. There are still miners alive in the Caribou who worked there in the 1950s. And when some of these guys went down 
right down the shaft, and then started. Then they started tunneling out from bedrock. They were really astounded with how rich the ground was. The ground was staggeringly rich. They could look into the gravel, even under, even under the lights, and see the, see the gold sticking right to the gravel wall. In fact, I was talking to an old miner in, uh, in Cold Spring House some years ago, and he was working down there with a partner, and they came up for lunch, because they didn't eat down below, and there's a reason for that, which I'll elaborate on in a minute. They, they came up for lunch, and the guy sits down beside him, and he says, well, would you like to see a really good lunch? And the guy said, yeah, I'd like to see it. Guy opens his lunch pail, and there's several thousand dollars worth of very coarse nuggets. And he'd been helping himself, unknown to the owners of the mine. Of course, that was in the 1950s. This is the high grader. This is the high grader. This is, that's, a, that's a gentle term for thief, you see. And uh, really what it, what it was, this was a very dangerous mine to work in because they had the caribou slum, Mike, which was breaking through all the time. They had to have a pumping system, a, a marvelous pumping system. And even then, they could barely keep up with the water. And they had 12-inch timbering down there. And the guys who worked there told me when they were working, the most disconcerting thing, they were working in water that was up to their knees quite often digging away, making sure that they got all the gold off the bedrock, and even then they didn't get it all, and they'd hear crack, crack. These were the 12-inch posts splitting like matchsticks. And that's still how down there. Is. I mean, that's the lure of gold, too. They want to get every bit they can. Well, sure. Sometimes it was in the dirty 30s, sometimes in the 50s, and jobs were hard to get. And eventually, however, they didn't get all that gold in the wing dam, and they had to pull out the whole workforce, and they just made it because the whole working's flooded. So that, you know, we're looking, at, we're looking at a creek that, in my estimation, has well over $100 million in gold at today's prices, possibly as much as $200 million. The pay streak is probably 60 or 70 feet wide. It's probably at least averaging three to four feet thick. <laughs> and the nuggets are probably ranging up to that, that, those nuggets as large as they were found in Butcher Bench, which was high ground. And, uh, you know, so you, you, you find this is, this is an area that I think has a great deal of potential. Okay, we're going to take a break and come back in just a second and talk a bit more about Lightning Creek, the hearts it broke, the riches it made. We'll do that after these words. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley on Lightning Creek. Van Winkle's one of the towns we mentioned. Yeah. Uh, Van Winkle actually got mined and gave birth to a whole other town. Well, what happened is the ground of Van Winkle was found to be gold-bearing, so they simply tore down Van Winkle. And, but they had a post office in Van Winkle, so they put the post office down in Stanley and called Stanley Van Winkle. And then they called it Stanley. And after then they, they called it Stanley. I understand. Yeah. Where did the name Van Winkle come from? Do you know? Well, I don't know. It sounds like a literary name, of course, and it may indeed be, because it isn't a well-known name in the West, Mike. I really, really can't answer that question. It only appears in the Caribou. That's right. As far as I know, it doesn't appear in Washington State or anywhere else in British Columbia or anywhere else in the Yukon. Stanley. Where does it come from? Same thing. I really can't. Probably named after a miner, and it's probably named after a miner or a town. That was that was quite commonplace. And Stanley, you know, is kind of interesting because it went through the rise and fall of all these, all these strikes in, on Lightning Creek. So Stanley was there in the late 1860s and 1870s, Mike. Significant town, much bigger than Win Van Winkle ever was. Then it's there again, uh, all the way through, right up to the Depression of the 1930s. And, you know, it's really a colorful town in the 1930s. A lot of people are drifting back in at the depths of the Depression to tap some ground that had been missed by the old-timers or rerun some of the tailings that they really hadn't done a good job on. Now, so some the, of the names, too, in these photographs we're taking a look at, the Southams. Well, I mean, sure. that's an, is that anything related to the Southam of uh, rich fame in the Lower Mainland? I, I really can't answer that. You know, we, we have the two Southam brothers. Richard is, is pictured there sitting down, and, and a few paces away is his dog, Jip. And old Jip, you know, it's funny, you know, we have a whole bunch of men in the, in, the, in the photograph and a few women, but you can only name two individuals, both Southam brothers and the dog, Jip. We don't know who the other individuals are. That's Stanley. Yeah. Bigger than Van Winkle, 1,000 people? Uh, do, you, do you hazard a guess well, on Well, I would population? think at its height, it was probably close to 1,000 people, maybe a little bit under that. Had three or four hotels, a number of general stores. In fact, it, it, it still attracts people. And a few years ago, about 15 years ago, old Tom Crawford was mining there along with his wife, Lil. And my wife and I went went into the area to look at the area and take some photographs. And I was doing some research on Lightning Creek. And Tom was a very, very interesting man. And he was doing well on a little side channel, really, Mike. 
And he said, Bill, he says, I want to I want to show you the old the old uh, the old drainage system of the Vancouver, the Victoria, and the Vulcan. So it was kind of interesting. It was early spring, and and so my wife and I went along, and he went out on a on a kind of a, a, a timber which was round and a little dangerous because if he'd stepped off that timber, that current gets him, sucks him right down through the drainage ditch several hundred yards, he's gone. He and he said, survive. and he looks down, and, and, and old Tom was getting on at this time, that's 15 years ago, and he, and he slips. I grabbed him by the arm, my wife grabbed him by the other arm, and he turned white as a sheet. Oh, and he yeah. said, don't tell Lil, don't tell Lil. And of course, he didn't want Lil to know that what could have happened in the diggings. Yeah. And that's what occasionally does happen in those diggings. So this is a very fascinating place. I mean, one of the old hotels is still standing there. Some log cabins, the remains of log cabins are there. And if you go down creek from where old Stanley stood, you go up on the bench in their cemetery hill. And many of the old original graves are still there and uh, picket fences and all the rest of it. It's a really quite a fascinating area, Mike. Yeah. As rough as it was, they did do some finishing touches. The headstones, the crosses and stuff are still there. That was, that was important. Oh, yes. Even though the town may have been ragtag, it was important to do things right. Oh, for sure. When, when somebody was buried, they, they made sure it was done right. And, and they kept their cemeteries really in, in quite good condition, too. Really quite surprising. But your statement earlier in the show that this place has the potential. Now, what did they try to do to get at this gold? Because man is demonic when it comes to getting hold of gold. What technologies Mike, did they employ? They've tried freezing that ground. They thought of all sorts How would of they freeze wild it? and wonderful schemes. They would, uh, they would put down uh, a certain type of chemical which actually can freeze the ground. They tried it. It didn't work and it was highly touted that it was supposed to work. They thought of machines that are not operated by man, but only by computer to go underground and mine that, mine that, that, that rich trench, or we, what we call the gut of the creek. But I think really, when I, when I look at Lightning Creek, I see a great deal of romance in the creek itself. Here's a creek that yielded fortunes to many individuals. It broke many other individuals. It's really part of the, of the, of the mystique of the caribou. And I think the, the 100 to 200 million dollars that remains in, in Lightning Creek, and that's probably not an overestimation, I think that's reasonably conservative, will stay there, at least in our lifetime, so that our kids and our grandchildren will see Lightning Creek and realize that this is one of the last of the great untapped creeks of the caribou. The technology will probably win. I mean, you can't just sort of scour. Remember what they did in the bullion pit. I mean, they just yeah. hosed down the, the sides until they got all that they wanted out of there. Why, why don't they just try that on uh, Lightning? The difference is in the bullion pit, water was your ally. In Lightning Creek, water is your enemy. Because they, didn't, they needed water in the bullion pit to hose it down, but they weren't below water level. Lightning Creek, and that goal is in the gut, far below water level, in some cases, 185 feet. So that's a real problem, And Mike. you can't dam up, dam up all those streams and just sort of gouge it out with big machines? No. The, the, the environmental laws won't let you do that, and that's probably a good thing. All right. Just think of it. There it is sitting 180 feet yeah. under your little shoes. Yeah. When you walk there, maybe this, uh, this year, $200 million worth of gold and nuggets as big as potatoes. Oh, sure. Oh, well. Any other area up there that you're interested in? Well, there are lots of, lots of lost mine stories in the caribou itself. And I think one of the most intriguing ones is from, is from Jacket Club's Creek. And Jacket Club's Creek flows from the south side into Jacket Club's Lake, very near the old town of Wells, and east, really, excuse me, west of Barkerville itself. And you know, an American miner whose nickname was Jacket Club's discovered that in 1861. And at first they got very, very good ground on Jacket Club's Creek. But this is a creek that is really quite unique. And the reason it's unique is because I feel that, that and some of, the old, uh, some of the old miners there allude to a lost channel on Jack of Clubs Creek. And it seems that the present channel is not the original channel of that creek. In other words, the old channel came across and hit that creek at spots. And that's where the old miners got their very, very rich gold, where they intersected the old channel mm -hmm. with the new channel, Mike. And um, so I think that, that there's some possibilities in Jack of Clubs Creek. Now, again, this is another creek in the Caribou that a lot of people have gone broke on. And, but it's right in the heart of the gold area. It's right near where all those gold creeks radiate out from like the spokes of a wheel. Mm -hmm. and, but Jack of Clubs Creek is the only one that has never produced a lot of gold. And so how would you look for a, a high channel? I mean, would you go get, maybe I'm asking for secrets here, but would you get aerial photographs to show a, a lean in the ground or something like that? No, because aerial photographs don't tell you 
necessarily what the tertiary channels or old channels are. So you look for the obvious signs. You look for ironstone. You look for rusty gravel. You look for a difference in the color of the gravel. We'll see a yellow gravel or a blue gravel like Spruce Creek in the, in, in the Atlin district. You look, for, you look for colors. You have to look for bedrock. So you have a lot of high channels running through the Caribou district. You had an old high channel in the Slough Creek area, the old Hong Pit. And uh, so if you're looking for high channels, and you can look all through the Caribou, both west and east of Barkerville, there's, there are high channels running through Antler Creek. We know that. There's a very high channel in the Antler Creek area. Now, would you go in there, for example? I mean, how would I go in there? Would I walk in with my little gold pan and uh, tinker around in the bush? Or would you go in with a backpack and, and provisions? Is there any way, how would you recommend going at it? Well, I, I would think that, first of all, you get the maps of the area, Mike. And you'd get the map, we'll say, of, of Antler Creek if you want to look for the high run. And then you look for the old workings on Antler Creek. And if we're looking at a map of Antler Creek, you'd probably use the Amos Bowman map of 1887 or 1888. And that's, that's a map over 100 years old. Very accurate, so accurate, Mike, that it shows in some of those areas exactly, precisely where the cabins were. Sometimes it shows where the post office box was, right on the trail. That's so accurate those maps. Bowman was in the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> retentive. <laughs> well, sure, he was with the Geological Survey of Canada. Yeah. And uh, so this, this map we're looking at on, on Antler Creek shows all the details of Antler Creek. And it shows where you should start, how deep the diggings were, and where you think where you would plot the old channel coming through, which may have been in Antler Creek several hundred feet above the present channel. And there are high channels going through the Caribou that are several hundred feet above the, above the channels of today in these creeks. Should I drop by the Goal Commissioner's place to find out if somebody's got it staked? I mean, how serious is this? Uh, that's a concern if you were a recreational panel well, or something. sure it is. The onus is on the individual who's prospecting. He has to know whether that ground is staked or not. Mm. Now, he is allowed access to that ground if he's the holder of a free miner certificate. So, but only access. He is not supposed to, to pan any gold. He is not supposed to check that ground if it is held legally by somebody else. He is only allowed access through on his way prospecting, and no owner can legally stop you, although some attempt to do so. Very interesting. Okay. Lightning Creek took out hun how many millions before it, before it was gone? Well, the, the, the official record is three or four or five million, but that's ridiculous because that would only be several hundred thousand ounces, Mike. And most of the miners, like old Unversacked, did not declare what they got. They and, there, and there were lunch kits of nuggets heading out as the high, as the high graders took their little bit as well. Sure. And 200 million, maybe, Bill estimates, left down there because of the difficulty in extracting it because of caribou slum and all the other kinds of things. Thanks very much. Great. I've learned some lessons. I'll take it next time I go up in the bush with me as I look for that elusive El Dorado. That's our show for tonight. We'll be back again next time. So join us then for Gold Trails and Ghost Towns with our storyteller, Bill Barley. Bye-bye.